Most, most of y'all know what I'm talking about when I say that the majority of small towns have a certain group of characters. And what I mean by characters is I mean people who differentiate from the norm. They are just, they stick out and they're not bad people most of the time. They're just different people. I mean, I, since I've been in Mena, I've gotten well acquainted with Barefoot Amy. Does anybody know Barefoot Amy? She is a good friend of mine, but that woman can walk barefoot on rocks, gravel. She rides her horse. She, uh, only time she puts on shoes is flip-flops to go into Walmart because it's acquired. There are people like that in every little town. It was that way in the town I grew up in. I remember we had, uh, for some reason, they tend to congregate around McDonald's or diners. But we had this one dude named Frank who was skinny as a rail, but he had the biggest ears you've ever seen. I mean, they were triple size ears. It would just hang. And the thing that was that made him a character is that he he had no sensitivity to cold whatsoever. He always wore a short sleeve shirt. It could be sleeting outside. It could be ice on the sidewalk. And he was very proud of going in his short sleeve shirt with no undershirt. And then we had Tommy Fry, who was a Vietnam vet. And uh, I don't know what all he saw, but I know what all he took when he was in Vietnam. He came back not to quite the same dude. And he would hang out. He lived in his car at one of the most popular swimming holes in the community. And he would decorate his car. Now, if, see if you can picture this. It, it looked like something from a Zulu movie or something. It, it, he would take clay from the creek bank and, and paint all these things on it. And then he would cake the clay on. And he had all these bamboo shoots sticking out from his car in different directions. And, uh, and, and it seemed like I was the only person in town that could really relate to him. <laughs> and uh, there was another, I could go on, but the, the main one I wanted to tell you about was a retired Marine sergeant by the name of George Singleton. Now, George Singleton was not, a, he was a character for different reasons. Uh, he was, uh, he looked a lot like Dalton Doty, only had more hair on his head than Dal Dalton Doty does. That's the only difference I see. He had a crew cut all the time, flat top. Uh, he was... He was retired and therefore had time. He was an excellent writer. And he wrote a column in the newspaper every week. It was called Somewhere in Time. And he would write about historical stuff from the area. But Sergeant Singleton especially loved to write about ghost stories, about spirits. And, and uh, there's a lot of old buildings in that area, old cemeteries and and he would write stories about things he'd seen and experienced when he would go after dark and hang out in cemeteries. Uh, women in antebellum dresses walking around in the cemetery looking at the graves of their children, things like that. It was in the weekly newspaper. And he meant business. I talked to him at McDonald's. I questioned him. And he asked me, do you believe in spirits? And I at that, I think I was 18, I said, well, I believe in the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, well, of course, but I'm talking about spirits. Do you believe in spirits? And he began to tell me about the spirits of this one particular old church and the graveyard that went with it. It's called uh, Old Scotland Presbyterian Church. It, it's probably one of the oldest standing structures in my home county. Old Scotland Presbyterian Church established 1823. This is, a, this is a place way up in the woods. It's currently surrounded by paper company land, but at one time in the 1800s, there was a thriving community there, lumber business, that sort of thing. And this was the place. There, there's a plaque inside that I saw once this church at Old Scotland, this was the place where all the young men from the area came and signed up for the Confederate Army. And then from there, marched together all the way to Mobile, Alabama, which is 100 miles. And it had, so this place is, had a history. And uh, I'll show you a picture of the church itself. 
this was taken at night because last time I went there it was night. Didn't go at night on purpose. This was back at Christmas when I was visiting my family at Christmas. I went there with an old high school buddy with my wife and my two sons. And you can't tell a lot about it, but you can get a little feel. But if you really want to get the spirit of the place, you'll, you'll, you'll pay attention to the nighttime photo. And so I thought while we were there, I mean, let's go out in the graveyard and see what we can turn up. So <laughs> that's a picture of my son Luke and Melina and I think it's my other boy Jake. They're just peeping down there reading headstones. Uh, Singleton said that uh, he's seen... He's seen men dressed like Confederate officers roaming around that place. I don't know what to make of that, and I don't even have an opinion on that, but that does introduce a subject that I do know a little more about, and I do want to talk about that, and, and that is spirits. Obviously, there's the Holy Spirit, are there other spirits? If so, what kind of spirits are they? Where are they? How did they get there? What do they do once they're there? Well, those are important questions. Um, I, the, the first place I ever started sensing the spirit of a place was, not surprisingly, in churches. You know what I'm talking about? When you walk in the door of a church it doesn't take long I mean to sense the spirit of this particular church it can be cold it can be warm uh, it can be inviting it can be repelling it can you can walk in and just feel the love or you can walk in and you can feel the eyes on you and this this varies from church to church and here's the interesting thing, it, it, it seems to endure in a church even across generations. What I mean is uh, when you've got a church that's been in existence for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, you, you've had multiple generations born there, baptized there, died and buried there, raised their kids there. So it, the people are constantly changing, but the spirit of a place tends to remain constant in spite of the people moving in and out. And uh, one of my favorite songs from growing up uh, was called Holy Ground, and it, it went like this. When, when I walked in the door, I felt his presence, and I knew this was the place where love abounds. Uh, there's places you go and you, you, you sense the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's almost as if the people, I've talked about this before, I get some sense, I don't know how this works, but there's a sense in which the people who make up a congregation not only give off or generate or a spirit is there among them, but that spirit can sometimes remain even when those people are gone and a whole new generation has come. You can sense what's there. Sweet, sweet spirit or something not quite so sweet. Uh, the fanciest church I ever went into was Westminster Abbey in London. And uh, boy, you talk about an architectural masterpiece. That was one impressive place. And you may know that a lot of famous people are buried there. 3,300 people are buried in the vaults at Westminster Abbey. And they're all significant people from British history. Uh, a whole lot of kings and queens and Duke, Duke, Duke of Earls and barons and stuff like that. But then you got uh, famous literary figures, famous scientific figures. Sir Isaac Newton is buried there. Uh, Dr. David Livingston, the missionary, as in, in Africa, you meet a white man, Dr. Livingston, I presume, because that's, if you meet, that, that's who it's going to be at that time. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I, Charles Dickens, 
Charles Darwin, Stephen Hawking. I didn't realize until recently Stephen Hawking had died. Apparently he has, but he's buried <laughs> Westminster Abbey. Uh, and, 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 and so what, what kind of spirit that I encounter at Westminster Abbey in London? Well, I, I'll say this. Uh, it was not a sweet, sweet spirit where love abounded. Uh, but it also, it wasn't a dark, evil spirit either. either. <laughs> if I had to summarize what it felt like, it was more like a spirit of power. This is the chapel of an empire. Power, intellectual power, scientific power, business, economic power, political power. Places have spirits and that brings me to a curious curious scripture actually a curious series of scriptures in the book of revelation chapters two and three that's where the seven churches are addressed and the way these seven churches are addressed is very different than the way say paul would address a congregation when he was writing. He would write it to the congregation, to the church at Thessalonica, to the believers in Corinth, uh, to the saints at Ephesus, that kind of thing. But these seven letters, short little messages, are not addressed to the congregation. In all seven cases, it's addressed to the angel of the church at fill in the blank. Everyone is addressed to the angel of a church. Well, it's an angel. It's, a, it's a, almost interchangeable with the spirit. Um, I want to give you some examples of what, what we're talking about. I'm going to go through these sort of quick. Uh, first of all, Revelation 2.1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. 2.8. To the angel of the church at Smyrna, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Next one. Verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. A few more. 2.18. To the angel at Thyatira write, I know your works, your love, and your service, and your patient endurance. Are you starting to see that God is very conscious of the spirit of the people in this church? What kind of people make it up? It's like we're talking about the corporate personality of a church. Each one of these churches has a unique spirituality. Each one of them is in a unique place, set of circumstances, facing this, dealing with that, either doing well, either not doing so well. Chapter 3, verse 1, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Two more, three, seven. And to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you kept my word. This is a church of humble people. It's a, it's a, a, a church of small people without a lot of power but they're standing up well amidst power. That's the personality we're dealing with here. Uh, 14 through 16, last one. To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. Here again, each one of these churches, it's addressed not to individual members, not even to the membership, not even to the congregation, but to the angel of the church. Again, we're talking about God is addressing the spirit of this people group, the, the collect, 
active personality of a church. You know churches have personalities. There are churches that are, that are fun-loving. There are churches that, that mean business, buddy. I mean, I think I'll tell you about the boy that visited here, boy. If they're under 49, I guess I call it, I consider him a boy. Uh, boy visited here a couple of years ago, and uh, he filled out a card. I texted him that afternoon. I said, I sure hope you had a good time. And he texted me back. He blasted me back. He said, I don't go to church to have a good time. Oh, well, do you go to have a bad time? Some people do. And some people don't feel like they've been to church unless they really go away feeling with their head hung in a salmon can, feeling awful. But uh, churches have these personalities. You can feel it. You can feel it. Uh, you can sense it in the corporate group. Uh, you can sense it in committee meetings. Uh, you, do you know that you can sense something of a church's spirit or the angel of a church, as Revelation calls it? You can sense something of a church's spirit in the architecture of the place. Because, why? The people who make up that church collectively all hopefully had some input into the design, the decor, the fountain, the, the wood, the rock, the Bass Pro Shop look that we have going on outside. Uh, I'll give you an example just the other day. People, people pay attention to, to, uh, to architecture. Uh, just, just Thursday afternoon, end of the day, me and Nate Renard were sitting out there on the front porch of the show, free bass and cocaine and listening to heavy metal music. And uh, this, lady, this lady pulled up in a, uh, he bought it. Uh, this lady came pulling up in a um, big maroon uh, Ford four-door what was it, a lariat? No, it was, it was a fancy package. She got out. You know what she said? Uh, she wasn't inquiring about the church. She said, can I look at y'all's building? Can I look at y'all's building? She said, it, it, it intrigues me. She said, I'm getting ready to build a house, and I want to do something similar to what y'all have done. And we had a big conversation, and, and she went in and looked around, and... What did that show her? It, it, it gave her some good ideas, hopefully, for her own house that she's building. New lady in town. She'll probably be here next Sunday, by the way. Her name's Cindy. And uh, it also gave her a feel for who we are. I mean, it, it's not normal to have food tables in your worship area. And people sitting on couches, like Brian and Lexi smooching over there. It's not, it's, not, it's not normal. It's not normal, but it's a good not normal, you know. Because we learned when we were at the resort that there's something about the mixture of food and fellowship all in the same room with the worship that just, it just fits us. Churches have a personality. Churches have a spirit. Uh, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, it's not only churches that have a spirit. Cities or towns have a spirit. You will sense a different spirit in Mena than what you will sense in Texarkana. And the... The fresher eyes you have and the more other places you've lived, the more quickly you'll recognize that Mena, or at least the surrounding area around Mena, has a pretty good spirit, pretty good personality to it. Uh, at least once a week, my wife at the bank says, on average, somebody comes for a loan moving from Texas, Louisiana, California, all kind of places. And almost all of them say the same thing. I've talked to them myself. Something just kind of draws me here. And I know if you've lived here your whole life, you don't know what I'm talking about. It's because you've been breathing it your whole life. But there's, there's, there's something cool about Mina. 
I, I, I sense it. Uh, but guess what else? Not just churches, not just towns. Schools have a spirit. I mean, obviously. We got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? You know, sp- uh, sports teams have a spirit. Factories have a spirit. Manufacturing plants, there's a spirit there. And it usually, it, it, it exudes from the owners and the managers, but also from the employees. Uh, homes have a spirit. Homes have spirits. Uh, at least older homes that have been inhabited for a while. Uh, homes have a way of taking on the, the, at least the personality, maybe even the spirit of, or the mentality uh, of the people who lived in it for a long time. That's why some homes that are physically, aesthetically pleasing to look at have this dark feel to them. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Others, though they're dilapidated, there's a sweet, sweet spirit there. It has something to do with the people who've inhabited. Families have a spirit. Lord, the families. I'm talking about extended families in particular. Things run in families. Every business, every corporation, every denomination, every team (sighs) is a combination of forces combination of visible forces and invisible forces every organization is a com- combination of inner and outer forces every organization is also a combination of spiritual factors and physical factors it's all mixed into that same soup and the Bible in talking at least about the organization of the churches in Revelation calls these angels the spirit of the churches now that brings up a question where these angels come from how'd they get there Uh, well the most common place that people that, that, that we think to look where did these angels come from well, it was the fall of Lucifer and a third of the angels with him, which comes from Isaiah 14. I want to read that, but also talk about it a little bit and give you a fresh way of looking at it, which you can agree with or not agree, but I want you to hear it one way or the other. Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 15. Uh, most translations call it uh, Lucifer, son of the morning star. That's, well, King James does, but... The actual Hebrew is addressed directly to an actual human figure who resembles Lucifer on several levels. There's a lot of parallels, but he's actually writing prophecies to the king of Babylon. And in the next chapter, chapter 15, Isaiah writes a similar prophecy to the rulers of Moab telling what's going to happen to them, what's wrong with them, and what's going to happen to them. King of Babylon, bright morning star, you've fallen from heaven. In the past, you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths in the ancient world and well you could say it in the present world too leaders with a whole lot of power start behaving like they're gods who don't answer to anybody else and that was a that's especially true in complete dictatorships it can happen anywhere though in a it can happen in business can't it It can happen in politics, but in the ancient world, it happened with kings. Many of them saw themselves as divine. Most likely the king of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, saw himself and was actually worshipped as a god. And this prophecy was directed to him. So how did we connect it to Lucifer and his fall, Satan? Well, a lot of that honestly goes back to a book published in the 1600s 
John Milton's Paradise Lost. The, the reality is a lot of our, the, the, the most common understanding people have of where Satan came from and where the demons came from comes much more from Paradise Lost than it does from the Bible because the Bible does not address those things directly. However, I do want to say this very clearly. Although that was written to the king of Babylon, when you're dealing with Lucifer, the bringer of light, light bearer, you really are talking about the same thing. It does apply to Satan very conveniently, very well. Because Lucifer, the light bearer, much power, much beauty, much glory, but wasn't satisfied, wanted to ascend, wanted to be higher, wound up falling. And that's what happens to anybody. That's what happens to any organization, no matter how powerful, that stands in opposition to God. And that pattern not only fits Lucifer, it fits every dark, powerful force in this world. That pattern. Because you know what always happens? To a group that begins to grow in power. I mean, it is almost pessimistic to say, but I think there's at least some truth in it. Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, not a lot of people can be trusted with a whole lot of power. Uh, like Lucifer, uh, angels, spirits, corporations, kings, rulers, presidents, principals, police chiefs, they were all created by God. God is the creator of all things. Listen very carefully. All powers on earth and in heaven, human and spiritual, really those two coincide quite often. All powers were created by God and they were created by God for good. That was the intent. But what happens is that organizations and sometimes people abuse that power they misuse that power their goal becomes like that of the king of Babylon and like Lucifer it the goal is all about me ascending me climbing up higher me stepping over somebody else and whoever I have to in order to get up there and it becomes about self exaltation um, Colossians 1.16 talks about how all these things came from God just like you and I ultimately came from God but that doesn't mean we're necessarily or always doing godly things that's a choice we have to make for through him God created everything in heavenly realms and on earth he made the things we can see that's the spirit world, spiritual dimension. And the things, no, no, I'm sorry. That's the, that's the visible world and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him. And pay attention to the last three words. Not only was it all created through Christ, it was created for Christ so was I and so were you and so our purpose is to serve God's purposes and anytime an individual or an organization large small a church a school a state a nation a corporation diverges from that purpose of realizing, hey, I'm here for God, uh, we tend to start thinking we're here for us. That's where the trouble comes. It happens with... All right, let me, let me say this. Governments, institutions, corporations, news networks of every kind, and I'm sure you're thinking about the kind you don't watch, okay? 
<laughs> they're all necessary. They're all necessary. We need them. Institutions are just part of a society, even primitive societies. They just have simpler institutions. They're all necessary. I mean, uh, I'm, we need an education system. We need police departments to call on. Uh, a lot of police departments around the country, by the way, have a, a really good slogan that they print on their police cars. I love this. I'm not sure what the ones in Mena say. I haven't noticed, but it says, but the common thing now, to protect and serve. Okay, doesn't that sound like what police force ought to do? To protect and serve? Yeah. Well, that's really what every government institution is here to do. Some are more into protecting, some more into serving. And protecting and serving is the purpose for which they were created, you with me, in the first place. But we get away from serving and protecting and we become more like beast, beast-like beast like um, you read in Revelation about the the beast and uh, the the Revelation is a book that I think has multiple fulfillments it had a fulfillment that was directed at the people the Christian people living at that time and I think it applies later into human prophecy world prophecy too but at the time the beast for these people, was the Caesar, was the, was the Caesar, the Roman Empire. That was the beast, and and you know you know what the Roman Empire used to brag about, like the Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. But how was this? I mean, in other words, to protect and serve. But do you know how this peace was achieved? It lasted 150 years without any significant war anywhere in the Mediterranean region. And it's because every single country in the Mediterranean region was dominated and had already been whipped and was controlled by Rome. It's kind of like Sam Colt's 1873 Peacemaker revolver. I mean, <laughs> you get peace when your enemy is resting in peace, that, that kind of thing. And so the Pax Romana uh, kept things peaceful, but it did it through force and manipulation there's something beast-like about that. How do you keep peace where you work? How do you keep peace in your home? Is it Pax Romana? <laughs> Is it through force and manipulation? I'm going to read the two scriptures back to back. Revelation 13. And then 1 John 4, 3, talking about the beast, talking about manipulation. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads so that they cannot buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Uh, 1 John 4, 3, this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now, what does that beast thing have to do with spirit of Antichrist? Well, <laughs> Antichrist, that's in the world already. It already was in the world at the time of Revelation's writing. It's certainly still in the world today. Antichrist means the opposite of Christ. Christ, the teachings of Christ are really about love and service and sacrifice to others love service sacrifice to others mark 10:45 jesus speaking of himself even said you talk about somebody that had power and yet knew how to use it without abusing it he came not to serve he said i came not to be served but to serve, you hear me? Came not to be served, but to serve. Now, anytime you find 
the spirit of Antichrist, demons, fallen angels, whichever term you prefer, whether you see it in an organization, a company, some sort of board, some political system, some education, or some university. Uh, if the spirituality of that institution, of that system, is mainly about self-preservation, that's the spirit of Antichrist, even if it happens to be a church. Because the church, too, is an institution, which is why churches especially have to keep our eyes open. Whenever any organization gets away from serving and gets focused on being served, self-protection, self-exaltation, Spirit of Antichrist has come in. That's a dark, dark angel. Well, what's a Christian to do about all this? Well, first of all, recognize that the spiritual world is there. As Paul said, learn to discern the spirits. Anytime you run across power serving its own interest, Boom, that's it. It's idolatrous. It's even demonic. And you know, one of the purposes of the church is to recognize that in ourselves first. Remember, get the log out of your own eye so that you can then help with the splinter in your brother's. A big purpose of the church is to recognize dark spirits, idolatry, and recall groups, institutions, systems back to their real vocation, which is exist being created by God for God. And the way do to, by the way, the, the way you do something for the God who needs nothing is you do things for people whom God loves. Ephesians 3:10, one other one I want to read to you. This, has, this talks about the mission of the church. To the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. You know what that amounts to? Watch for these self-serving, self-protecting, self-perpetuating tendencies in yourself, in your family, in your church, and in every single organization you ever find yourself involved in. Because there's going to be a certain amount of it there. Wanting to grow and expand. So what does the Bible say? Where do we start? Judgment is to begin at the house of God. Know this. When it comes to self-serving behavior, it's way easier to spot in other people than it is in ourselves. So ask the most honest person you know who knows you well. Sit still. Put duct tape over your mouth while they answer. But before you zip on the duct tape, says, ask them, please tell me, where in me do you see self-serving, self-protecting attitudes and behaviors? Um, I, I want to give more examples, but I, 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 I got to get this one in. Um, there is a dark spirit of consumerism and materialism which is rampant in present day America this, the spirit of consumerism is, is the beast is like the beast that's never satisfied the, the, a, 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 
a person who's overwhelmed with the desire for things, uh, well, that beast demands human sacrifice, if you know what I mean. And it's never really satisfied. It's always going to want more. It's always going to ask for more. That's not the way capitalism is supposed to work, folks. You heard of Adam Smith. Adam Smith was an 18th century philosopher of capitalism. Some say he was the father of capitalism. Listen to what he said. Business exists to serve the general welfare. This almost sounds biblical because it is. Businesses exist to serve the general welfare. Profit is the means, not the end. It is a reward businesses receive for serving the common welfare. Now, there's a man with his head aligned with the truth of the New Testament. Not merely to be served, but to serve. What does what the scripture say? You were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. You ever give much thought to that? That's true in every area of life. Um, you were bought with a, somebody, whatever you have, whatever you have, whatever you get to do, uh, whoever you get to be, you have that, you are that, you get to be that because somebody else is paying a price of some kind. Employers, you're in that position because of employees. Employees, Guess why you're in that position. You wouldn't have that position without employers, okay? Teachers. Are there because of taxpayers. Preachers are there because of tithers. Businesses, why are you there? Because of customers. Manufacturers, doctors. Nurses, why are you there? You wouldn't have a job if there weren't for patients. The bottom line is, uh, nothing is really free except the air we breathe. All of us have to receive. All of us receive. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way God made the world. All of us receive from what others do. And that is fine so long as we keep it balanced. All of us are receivers. Just make sure you're a giver too. Because there's something way out of whack when a person is focused on receiving, receiving, receiving and is really not doing any giving, giving, giving. That's what makes for a fair and equitable society. That makes for healthy families and churches. So let me say it this way. Sum it up this way. Everybody in this room, however you see yourself, I know some things about you that are true. You have a certain amount of power over somebody you have a position somewhere that you occupy you have a certain amount of influence some of us have more than others but we all got some and all of us have time energy and money when it comes to your power your position your influence when it comes to your time your energy and your money oh my goodness don't exists simply to be served for that is the spirit of antichrist learn that you exist like Christ to serve and to give think and live that way and guess what wherever you live wherever you work wherever you go 
when you're seeking to serve rather than be served, guess what? Whatever place you're in, there's going to be a sweet, sweet spirit in that place. And it will be the spirit of the Lord. 